Moscow, Christmas time. Tolstoy's Moscow, from the time of the Tsars to now, the time of Yuri Andropov. And this Moscow at Christmas, some things are missing, snow and cold. The Moskva River has not frozen over. So far, the bear of a Russian winter is a gray pussycat. The grand and ornate buildings are lit up, not for Christmas, but in celebration of the 60th anniversary of the creation of the Soviet Union. Moscow has its best suit on for the delegations from more than 100 countries here this Christmas week. But there is no Christmas here, with or without snow. In this secular society, there is only a fragment of memory of the birth of Christ. Only 40 Russian Orthodox churches function in a city of about 8 million, where a relative handful of believers, mostly the elderly, will celebrate Christmas in early January. In Russia, Father Frost, not Santa Claus or St. Nicholas, is the symbol of giving for the New Year, not Christmas. In past years, Father Frost brought gifts by Troika, a three-horse sleigh pulled along over snow provided by the snow maiden, and she has time. These are New Year trees, the only non-political displays available around Moscow, and they stand in front of the city's biggest toy store. Politics cannot change everything. This is still a children's holiday season whatever it is called. Merry Christmas, Stan Bernard, NBC News, Moscow. It's not just any old hat. It's a shopka, a fur shopka, or a yushanka, a fur hat with ear flaps. In this supposedly classless society, your hat can mean you've got class, status. A Muscovite with a keen eye can tell a real fur from a fake. Real is better. Is it plastic or is it real lynx? Or fox? Or nutria, a kind of water rat? And muskrat is very fashionable this year, so is squirrel and raccoon. Of course, mink and sable are very big and expensive every year. And real is expensive, ranging from 45 rubles on up to nearly 200. That is almost $300, and more than most Russians make in a month. Dogs seem to be safe again. A real fur hat is so expensive and sought after. A pet St. Bernard was killed for his pelt a few years ago. Russian dog lovers raised a howl, and the incident appears to have been isolated. This is one of the largest and best stocked Berioskas a store for foreigners living and working here who pay in Western currency and pay more for the privilege. For the foreigner, the shopka is the classic useful souvenir of the Soviet Union. Going hatless in this society and in this weather brands you as a foreigner, an outsider, and probably something of a fool. The compensating factor is you don't get asked for directions very often. Stan Bernard, NBC News, Moscow. The construction of this building has gone on endlessly. It is nearly three years in the making and nowhere near finished. And the new Soviet leader, Yuri Andropov, has strongly attacked laziness, absenteeism, and shabby work out of people when they do work. In a country where the state owns everything, the attack by the big boss was picked up as a signal by Pravda, the Communist Party's newspaper, to publish complaints from workers about the work habits of their comrades. A truck driver rode in saying arriving late on the job was endemic, so was drinking on the job. And more time was spent doing personal chores, such as picking up a load of wood for a mother-in-law on the state's time and with state equipment, and less time hauling loads for state enterprises. He told of graft taken in by the drivers, graft in the form of food which turns into a trucker's picnic at the end of the workday. And he said the supervisors are just as lazy, and they are operating a private car repair business for their personal profit. Soviet TV picked up the queue from Andropov and Pravda and within the week had a reporter standing out in front of a factory gate and caught this worker in the middle of a morning who said he was going to see a friend. Everything, including taxis, is state-owned. But a private enterprise streak has survived. Cabs in Moscow operate off the meter as much or more than they do for the government. A modern TV assembly plant 
and Communist Party members and workers in the plant were at a gripe session on productivity. She says moderate vodka drinking on the job doesn't affect much. He argues that being at work is not enough. It's the quality of the work that matters. The new Soviet leadership is obviously worried about the problem of worker motivation. They call this entire issue discipline and not productivity, and discipline appears to be the right word. The new building for the KGB, the secret police, was built in 18 months. For here, that is nearly record time. Stan Bernard, NBC News, Moscow. Huh? Eastern Afghanistan. The Kremlin is now publicly admitting the civil war here has been bloody and that thousands have been killed. The Karmal government forces, backed by more than 100,000 Soviet troops, is suffering serious setbacks in the war against the rebels. Here in Moscow, Soviet TV and newspapers are making an unprecedented effort to report Afghanistan war developments and are attributing any success the rebels are having to the United States. Captured rebel weapons are described as American-made recoilless rifles, Egyptian mortars, and Italian landmines. The Soviets say, in caravans like this, rebels, who they call bandits, are filtering in from Pakistan. With rare candor, the Soviets are reporting their failure to crush the rebellion and are showing incidents of what they call murder and pillage. The results of a bombing in a village. They are reporting on power and communication lines being cut, roads being mined, and these people are described as villagers who have organized to defend their homes against the rebels. The governor of the province lashes out at President Reagan, telling the villagers Reagan will defend Islam the same way Reagan defended Islam in Beirut. The Soviets are calling the fighting in Afghanistan an undeclared war by the United States on the Afghan people. The motive for the sudden rash of reports is not clear. But it is known the Chinese are putting increasing pressure on the Kremlin to pull its troops out of Afghanistan. And next week, UN Secretary General Perez de Cuellar comes to Moscow. High on his agenda, a Soviet troop withdrawal. Stan Bernard, NBC News, Moscow. Andrei Gromyko never used the word reject, but it amounted to the same thing, a flat rejection of the Reagan interim arms proposal. Frankly speaking, we do not believe that uh, Washington counted on any other reaction on our part. It was an unusual news conference. First, it was rare. Gromyko's previous news conference in Moscow was in 1979, and today's was televised and translated, all two hours of it. Much of what Gromyko said was aimed directly at the anti-nuclear movement in the U.S. and Western Europe. He charged President Reagan with preparing a nuclear holocaust that would consume hundreds of millions of lives, and he said the Kremlin was in solidarity with anti-nuclear activists. Then he got to the substance of the Kremlin rejection of the arms proposal. He said the new offer reduces and does not enhance the chances of the Soviet Union and the United States reaching an agreement because it does not take into account nuclear armed aircraft, which he called a dreadful component. It does not take into account aircraft carriers armed with nuclear weapons. And it does not take into account British and French intermediate missiles, which the Soviets wanted counted in their original proposal. And he said the White House proposal makes a new demand that Soviet intermediate missiles be eliminated in the Asian part of the Soviet Union, where he said they are needed to counter an American nuclear threat from Korea and Japan. Romiko said that alone would make the new proposal unacceptable. NATO would have an almost 2.5 to 1 advantage in such warheads over the Soviet Union. While it is a rejection, Gromyko avoided a question from NBC News on whether the Kremlin will be flexible on another of its demands, that no new U.S. missiles be deployed in Western Europe. It left the impression there is room for hard bargaining when the Geneva talks resume in May. Gromyko made it clear the bargaining will be hard, and he's looking for help for the Soviet position on the streets of the U.S. and Western Europe this spring and summer. Stan Bernard, NBC News, Moscow.